As a fire forces more Coloradans out of their homes, we look at how fire mitigation can help some people a lot more than others. And it was looked at as, an, uh, as a, a serious offense in boarding school. Speaking, uh, speaking our language. A Coloradan had to fight to regain her history. A judge finds evidence that prominent conservatives in Colorado spread election misinformation, putting one man at risk of being killed. The state's largest energy company is one step closer to getting you to pay for its really horrible weekend. And your Friday good news is a little sweaty. This is just kind of like, come out, have fun, celebrate, um, and get some good uh, activity time in. Sweat a little, smile a lot more, because this is a Friday on Next. The wildfire conditions in Colorado mean that any growing fires have the potential to spin up into monsters. So it is really not encouraging that firefighters in Teller County don't have any containment on the fire that started about this time yesterday. Fortunately, that fire is not near a whole lot of homes. A few dozen are evacuated. What they're calling the High Park Fire has burned almost 700 acres west of Cripple Creek. 120 people who are out of their homes have the option to stay at schools nearby. If you happen to be watching us from down in that part of Colorado, the sheriff's office says that they could use people to drop off donations of water, Gatorade, cough syrups, and eye drops. Fire mitigation has the power to help save homes, though that prevention is not as realistic for every Coloradan. Here's Anusha Roy. The conversation around fire mitigation goes hand in hand with what we can afford. If money was not an obstacle, what could Colorado achieve? We would love to have uh, an amount of money that would allow for our mountains to have healthier forests and for those that live in the mountains to be better protected. The idea unveils the nuances of mitigation as we face off with wildfires. Spending more on mitigation would help certain parts of the state a lot. If you think about the effort that it would take for us to mitigate the forest in our beloved mountains, it would be astronomical in terms of pricing and land and the amount of people that it would take to perform this. But isn't as realistic in other areas like the Eastern Plains, where Hugo Fire says it's harder to ask farmers and ranchers to mitigate the same land they are relying on for their income because it means losing production and money every year. So they use roads as fire breaks, especially around land that's trickier to mitigate and individual homes and businesses work on fire protection. Substantial portion of Douglas County that's in the wildland urban interface. That means trying to get out ahead of new developments. He's talking to them about the need to, to mitigate these areas as the, the new homes and new subdivision are being put in. Which brings us back to the ask for individual homeowners to protect their houses. Just last week in Jefferson County, Elk Creek Fire Rescue said a fire burned right up against a home. But because the property owner had mitigated their land, the fire slowed and they were able to get ahead of it. But the fire did burn right up to the property. And that house, it's still standing. We just heard from the Elk Creek Fire Rescue Department, said the same thing, that the homeowner did that mitigation work and that it absolutely helped save that home and is the reason that it is still standing right now. It works, costs money, therefore cash needed. Right, and so this was brought up so many times at the legislative session and right at the end, a bunch of bills were passed to head to the governor. Mm -hmm. One of them setting aside $10 million in grants to help out local government spending on mitigation. The other one saying, hey, if there is a prescribed burn, you gotta tell your local fire department so they can be on standby or be there if they need to help and a lot of other elements to support, especially our volunteer firefighters as well. And everyone I was talking to today said, you know, that's a great first step. Yep, I feel like you've really helped inform us about the needs of especially volunteer firefighters. Mm -hmm. Anusha, thank you. There are going to be no open fires in Summit County this summer, at least no legal ones. Summit Fire announced today that they are pulling all open fire permits and putting a ban on open burning from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Summit Fire plans to stop issuing burn, burn permits in the summertime going forward, and they admitted that the burn ban this year might need to extend into the fall. The county says the risk of somebody accidentally starting a wildfire just outweighs the benefits of being able to burn slash piles. Well, you can score another one for the big guy. It's great to see them win once in a while. XL Energy is a step closer to being able to charge Coloradans half a billion dollars for the expensive energy that XL bought during a winter storm last year. It was during that really bad cold snap when several Colorado energy companies, including Excel, purchased high-priced natural gas. When I say high-priced, 
it was upwards of 100 times the usual price when Excel bought it. In a filing for investors in March of last year, Excel reported that it spent an extra $650 million in electricity and natural gas costs because of cold weather in mid-February. The company has been fighting with regulators ever since because Excel wants to pass that cost on to you. Well, they're about to win that fight. An administrative law judge ruled this week that Excel can recover 221 mil from electric customers, 287 mil from gas customers. That would be an estimated 11% increase in the bill for residential gas, 2% increase for residential electric. State regulators still need to vote on this recovery plan. Democratic Governor Jared Polis is ticked that this is going to come out of customers' pockets rather than Excel's investors. Governor put out a statement saying, quote, I'm disappointed that utility providers are able to balance their financial loss on the backs of consumers when extra costs could have been avoided by better early warning systems for consumers to voluntarily reduce energy use. This ruling acknowledges that Excel did not properly prepare or warn Coloradans ahead of the storm, yet customers are now literally forced to pay the price. As for that idea of warning, hey, it's about to get super expensive, cut down on your use. There was a proposed bill that would have required utilities to give a heads up. That died in the state legislature back in April. The U.S. government is finally acknowledging the extent of the dark history of Indian boarding schools. The Department of the Interior has identified 408 boarding schools, five of them in Colorado, schools designed to assimilate indigenous children into white society at any cost. Some of those kids were abused and died. Our Katie Eastman spoke with a boarding school survivor in Arizona who now lives in Denver. I can get single skinny strands. At a kitchen table in Denver, pride replaces fear. I relate to what the stones are. Bessie Smith and her daughter Tina make traditional Navajo jewelry, the kind Bessie grew up wearing, up until she was 11 when she had to strip herself of the jewelry and everything else she'd ever known growing up on the Navajo reservation in Arizona. And so my identity was Zabaha, but then when I got to boarding school, I couldn't use that name anymore. The U.S. government gave her the name Bessie. She became one of thousands of indigenous children taken from their homes and forced to assimilate into Western culture at an American Indian boarding school. If we got caught speaking our language, we would get punished. Food was one of the punishments, food. Because of the psychological abuse, Bessie rejected her culture and became ashamed of her own family. I could not tell my parents because they didn't speak English. They didn't speak the language that I was suffering in. So that is the pain itself, too. It would be many years before Bessie began to take back what was taken away. Stringing beads, one by one, healed. It's therapy. But the name she had as a child was still gone. Somehow I, my heart was attached to my name. So I always wanted to get that back. It's how the mother-daughter pair came up with the name of their jewelry business. Her name, Zanbaha. And so now I am at the point of not feeling that I'm a victim anymore. I feel like I have traveled this journey through all these years and now I can say I survived. I'm me. Pain will not erase her pride. I was Katie Eastman reporting. The federal government says it still does not know precisely how many students were sent to these boarding schools and how many of them are buried on their grounds. Bessie told us that she hopes that this conversation now will also include a focus on healing for survivors and their family members. A judge has ruled that evidence shows prominent Colorado conservatives deliberately spread misinformation that the 2020 election was rigged. That ruling today clears the way for a lawsuit brought by a Coloradan who works for Denver-based Dominion Voting Systems. Eric Coomer was accused, without evidence, of being the guy who rigged the election. The claim came from Douglas County Conservative leader Joe Oltman. That's him on the left. He's the guy who's called for the hanging of his political opponents. Oltman was also recently nominated for governor at the Republican State Assembly by State Representative Patrick Neville. 
Altman declined after speaking in favor of some other conspiracy theorists who are on the Republican primary ballot. A judge ruled today that the Trump campaign and Rudy Giuliani pushed Altman's election rigging claim despite internal Trump team emails that there was no evidence of this. The Coloradan who brought the lawsuit, the guy who's suing, Eric Coomer, he went into hiding. After, according to the judge's ruling, Altman accused him of rigging the election, then disclosed his home address, encouraged people to find him, and called for him to be put to death. There are young Coloradans who come out of the foster care system relatively alone. They don't have the support that they need, and many have become young parents themselves by that point. There's a program in our community called Bridging the Gap that offers up to eight years of housing help, career coaching, even child care, if that's what people need to establish a foundation in life without a family. You have raised nearly $25,000 this week to help with that. Your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports the Bridging the Gap Project, Mile High United Way. They are there for young adults who can feel like no one else is. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, we'll send you the link to join me in giving. Together, we are going to help young Coloradans who are aging out of foster care find the support and the encouragement that they need to succeed. Hot COVID summer. Colorado's public health leaders predict we're about to see our second highest case counts of the pandemic. Good thing so many of us are protected. We're seeing right now is a migration from the eastern plains to the western slope. Miller time in Colorado. Not the beer that tastes like pennies. We're talking about moths. And we have a field day with your Friday good news. Well, kids do anyway. That's next. This is a great time to be protected against COVID-19 because it's circulating in Colorado now more than it has in recent months. The CDC just moved Denver and Boulder counties up to medium risk from low risk. Boulder City Council's nixing in-person meetings after several council members caught COVID. The state is not expecting some massive increase in COVID hospitalizations, but they do think that they're likely to quadruple from the current low level by the time we get to June. Our positivity rate's been increasing since mid-March when we were under 3%. Right now, nearly 8% of the official tracked tests in the state are coming back positive. The state thinks we're around 2,500 daily cases of COVID right now, and they think it'll be 8,500 per day by June. That would be the second highest case rate of the pandemic. Sunshine, 70s, and not as windy for some areas. Temperatures in the 80s in southern Colorado, and we're headed into the 80s territory tomorrow. Center of circulation to the north, spilling high clouds in along the front range, but not much moisture. Tracking the wind, which is pretty gusty over the higher passes and up in Wyoming, but calmer here at the surface. And that's a trend that should continue. Winds out of the north will shift and come in out of the southwest. That's going to keep things very dry. And red flag warnings remain in effect for high fire danger through 8 o'clock tonight. And we also have air quality alerts due to the High Park fire in Teller County. Air quality terrible down around Colorado Springs. Well, welcome to your weekend. Sunshine in 80 Saturday and upper 70s on Sunday. I was reading a bed in, uh, I was reading a book in bed the other night when I when I heard it. it was, you, know, you know, look left, look. And of course, you can't see the thing until it hits the light. You know, you know, Miller moth season. It's back and we can expect more of them than usual this year. Miller moths actually do this year-long dance across Colorado. In the winter months and early spring, they're out on the eastern plains. They're caterpillars, called army cutworms, and they're eating through any crops they can find. Then they cocoon underground, and in late spring, they pop out in Miller moth form, and they head west. They post up here around Denver, May and June. Then they do summer up in the high country, eating flowers. Then in the fall, it's back out to the eastern plains, and they begin the life cycle again by laying new eggs. A next viewer from the Plains reached out to us this week, curious about the moth outlook for the year, because you can forecast this. It's all predicated on weather. And if the weather is uh, supportive of, of these Miller moths, then we'll see really good numbers, um, especially in the spring. So during the spring, if we have dry or sometimes wet weather, but not too cold, we'll see really ample numbers of Miller moths being very successful. But if we see really hard freezes in um, early spring, then generally we'll see lower Miller moth numbers. I think with the, the mild spring and winter that we've had, I think we will see, there's a very good chance we'll see um, plenty of Miller moths this year. 
So, so that's, that's bad news for anybody who's got one of those newfangled electric lights at their house. Why is it exactly that Miller moths are so fixated on our lights? Flying, they follow using the moon as basically their compass. And so when there are additional lights that really distract them, so they get confused and they see, you've, everyone's seen um, a moth flying around a porch light. And they are basically trying to organize in their mind from a, like, from a compass perspective, like this is my, this is my directional um, North Star, if you will. And I'm going to keep going towards the North Star, but I'm going to keep hitting the North Star. You, you fool, that's not the North Star. That's my, that's my book light. Uh, the best way to keep them out of your house, of course, is just to turn off as many lights as possible. That way they'll go to your neighbors instead. Uh, Miller moths may annoy us, but they are delicious to birds and to bears up in the high country. So in the end, they're actually, they're pretty good for our ecosystem. It's good news, good day. That's a recipe for a Friday. Our quest to share the good in Colorado takes us to George Washington High School. This is good news because it, it allows all students a chance to participate. Good news that's inclusive too. Next. It's Friday. Five years of Fridays now. We have ended the week with the good news in your life. Anything that brings you joy is important enough that we should stop and hear it. Let's head for DPS's Adapted Unified Field Day for elementary and preschool students to ask our favorite Friday question. What's your good news? Okay, now. One, two, two three. Today's our elementary adapted field day. Um, we have students with and without disabilities coming out here today, and it's really just an opportunity for them to get some inclusive movement and interaction with their peers. This is good news because it, it allows all students a chance to participate. Yeah, we have a lot of peer-to-peer uh, -peer programs, we call them, or unified PE programs. And George Washington especially has like their AVID classes where they team up their students, their gen ed students with their students with disabilities. And we try to uh, do some real inclusive programming with them. You guys having fun? My good news is being able to interact with people that I don't even know and just trying to like have a connection with them. <laughs> Why is it good? Um, I'm really, um, this is a fire. For everyone? Yeah. We're outside for everyone for all the special ed need kids and all the students we help with the special ed need kids yeah. here at George and from the the DPS schools they came out and we're just having fun today. Well, I just love seeing them have fun and like being able to enjoy themselves because sometimes people are singled out based on if they have a disability or not and I feel like we should treat them all with equality because they're still human. Are you having fun? Yeah, you are. Yeah. I'm happy you're out here. Yay! Good news, good day. How about that? Pure joy. Back with your feedback that I'm ruining Colorado next. Carol writes in tonight about our Word of Thanks campaign to help kids leaving foster care in Colorado, saying, extremely worthy cause. Thank you for doing this as always. These kids need all the help they can get. Elza writes in to say, please, please, please leave. You don't like Colorado, leave town, please. I'd rather stay. Could we, could we put it up to like a, like a statewide vote or something? See you next time.